Good evening and welcome. I am Sandra Erickson, a librarian at the Stanford Health Library. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our talk tonight on primary care for LGBTQ plus patients. Take pride in your health. Our speaker tonight is Benjamin Laniakea, MD, a board certified family medicine physician specializing in full spectrum LGBTQ plus health. They are the medical director of Stanford's LGBTQ plus clinical program and have been the theme lead for the sex, gender, and sexual function curriculum at the Stanford School of Medicine. Throughout the talk, enter any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the talk, Dr. Lani Akea will answer as many questions as possible, time permitting. Dr. Lani Akea, I will turn over the screen to you now. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So again, my name is Benji Lani Akea. I use they, them pronouns. And it's really exciting to talk to you about this topic today. Typically speaking, I'm working with the medical students or the PA students or other faculty and teaching them on how to provide care for LGBTQ patients. So it's really you know, wonderful to actually be able to take that, take a minute and flip this lecture around from how it normally is tailored and tailor it directly towards patients. So we're going to go over not everything in LGBTQ health. It would actually take quite a while to go every single, go through every possible single aspect, but we can go through some key important points that maybe you should be thinking about when talking to your provider if you identify as LGBTQ+. Plus or if you perhaps have a loved one or someone you, you know, you, who you care for, who does identify as part of the community when they're going to their medical care. As a disclosure, I have no financial disclosures. Um, the hormone therapies that we will discuss later on in the lecture are not FDA approved. Actually, there are no FDA approved um, um, medications for the treatment of gender dysphoria, but everything we'll talk about is considered standard of care from the, uh, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, the Endocrine Society, the American Academy of Family Practice, the American Medical Association, and others. I will be using scientific forms, uh, terms for anatomy for clarity during the presentation, but I understand that not everyone uses these terms for themselves. And, um, you know, I, I, I will also not have any photos or images of any anatomy on the screen, so you don't have to be worried about potentially being shocked by any, any uh, images. But we will be, be speaking somewhat frankly about body parts and sexual activities. So uh, we'll start with like a very brief history. Um, you know, even through the 1970s, uh, the American Psycho uh, Psychological Association was kind of debating whether or not homosexuality was an illness, right? And um, and this this and and there was a discussion globally in the uh, late 1970s. Actually, uh, sweet, there was a Swedish patient who able was able to get disability leave for calling out homosexual, which I thought was really kind of hilarious in, the, in retrospect. Um, by 1973, our, the American uh, the American Psychological Association had stopped list uh, had stopped listing homosexuality as a disorder, and you know, we, and recognizing that homosexual is not really a term used by the community to, to identify themselves, but at the time was the term used for this diagnostic purposes. In the past, treatment uh, patients were treated really terribly. Um, that you know, with electroshock castration, and uh, in one particular instance, um, at least one in Alan, uh, Alan Turing's instance, treated with hormone therapy, despite the fact that he did not identify as as a uh, as gender diverse or as a trans feminine patient, but rather that they thought that this would somehow cure his sexual orientation. Um, so it's no real wonder that our, our LGBTQ patients really spend a lot of time avoiding the doctor or even to this day, right? I have patients um, and friends who tell me like, uh, where can I go see someone who's more, you know, apt to talk to me? Or even if my concerns aren't specifically LGBTQ or related to my sexual uh, sexuality or gender, um, there's a lot of trepidation about going to a provider who might not understand you or who might not be able to give you the care that's appropriate to you. Um, so when we talk about a lot of these 
gaps in um, uh, gaps in care for LGBTQ individuals. It's not necessarily that being trans or being queer or being gay or lesbian or bisexual makes you somehow more prone to smoking, depression, suicidality, uh, you know, having missed cancer screenings, right? These are all things that happen from not trusting the medical system, right? Or maybe not being able to access the medical system. Our medical system has huge gaps in it. Um, you know, when, when our trans patients attempt to, uh, uh, attempt to uh, uh, get um, hormone therapy or any form of medical management, in 19% of cases, and this was a study that came out from 2015, um, the survey was, uh, results were published in 2016, 19% were denied care. Um, and, and that matches my experience in 2015 when I referred patients to en uh, endocrinologists to try to get assistance, even not specifically with their gender, they were sometimes told, I'm sorry, but we don't help that kind of patient, which is, you know, ridiculous. Um, and 23% of our patients uh, the, in this same population, the transgender population or trans inclusive population, were just avoided because they knew that this statistic existed, if not at the actual number, they knew that this behavior would occur in the healthcare providers. And so they would, they many of them outright avoided healthcare. Um, in addition to other social factors from stigma and discrimination, such as uh, being kicked out of your own home, for instance, uh, you know, this, this is one of the only populations that parents might disown their children um, it, it, as, a, as a whole, right, as a, as a demographic, right, or where generational wealth wasn't able to be accumulated because of difficulty with family building or um, in, you know, more distant past, even being able to marry or have legal recognition. So clearly we have a lot of ways to go. There's a lot of problems, but it's not all doom and gloom, right? I think we spent a lot of time talking about the risk factors about the, uh, for the LGBTQ patient population and maybe not quite enough time focusing on what is available for us and what we should be doing as a community to really make focus on our health. So I've broken down this lecture into a few different aspects. The first aspect I'm gonna talk, to talk about is tailored sexual health. And we'll see each of these little mini, mini chapters that I'll go through are going to focus on something that you should think about for yourself. What, and, you know, if it, not everything is applicable, it's okay. Not everything has to be applicable. But thinking about how any of this, these keys may be important for you. Um, when we're talking about tailored sexual health, we're talking about the ability to have a conversation with your provider surrounding this, uh, the sexual health that is important to you. Sexual health is not some sort of optional health. It's not some sort of, oh, well, you know, like just don't have sex, you know, I, th I think, and that's what the, the uh, com community of the, uh, the medical community has really pushed in past decades. It's that, oh, well, sexuality is dangerous, you know, sex could give you sexual infections, right? And, you know, by in experiencing, you know, we, I've been told that, you know, that homosexual sex, act, uh, sexual activities, right, would be unhealthy somehow, right? That ha having sex with two male partners or two female partners would somehow be unhealthy, making some, uh, giving someone all of these adverse uh, health outcomes. But really, since that time, over the last few decades, we've really evolved our view of what sexual health is. Sexual health is a key component of human health, right? And it's so much more than just, are you, you know, are, do you have sex? But it's, are you happy having sex? Are you having healthy sex, right? And how do we protect you and keep you safe while you're having sex, not just don't have sex? Or how do we minimize these risks? We want you to be able to talk to your providers about your sexual practices from a practical standpoint, right? We don't need to elaborate detail as providers. So as a patient, being able to tell your provider, and this obviously needs, uh, you know, necessitates a provider that you feel comfortable talking with, but if you can talk to them about how your body parts connect, that can lead to a lot better screening, right? There are some, um, some STIs, for instance, sexually transmitted infections, where they will stay at the site of infection. And so, you know, if you do a general swab for them or a urine test or a blood test, you may not detect these sexually transmitted infections. So letting your provider know what body parts are touching which body parts and how your sexual practice might be in general, if not in explicit detail, um, can really help you with that. Having multiple partners or new partners obviously opens up things to more potentials for infection, right? So, Making sure you understand how window periods work, 
right? And the window period, meaning the time after you might be exposed to an infection and the potential time when the test will first show up positive will really allow you to give, again, we can't say 100% risk is reduced, right? But we can at least give someone a general sense of Hey, I'm tested. You know, it was, you know, it was technically within the window period, but I feel like, you know, I I know my other partners and they were tested, so I feel feel like the risk of infection is pretty low. And being able to have that frank and honest discussion with your partners allows us to be, you know, make informed decisions about what we want in our own health and our own sexual practices. Barrier contraceptions are great, right? And we all know about condoms. I think that's the probably the only form of uh, accurate birth control anyone talked about in uh, in contraception anyone talked about in our school uh, sex educations. But it really is very focused on penises in, in, in a lot of cases when we're talking about uh, sexual barrier contraception. Almost the only one that anyone knows of is the uh, is a is a condom. And some of you in the audience might be thinking, well, I also know about a dental dam. And that's great. But have you ever seen a dental dam in like a, you know, a CVS or a Target? Because I haven't, right? And I've looked. <laughs> it's It can be really difficult. So thinking about what are forms of barrier contraception that apply to you as in your sexual practices is really important for protecting yourself. So anytime, so if we think about sexual health and sexual uh, sexually transmitted infections, right? A sexual infection can be transmitted anytime two mucous membranes touch. And we're gonna use the term mucous membrane here to mean any, basically anywhere you are naturally have some moisture. So genitals and the opening of the genitals, the mouth, the oropharynx and the anus, right? Are these kind of these mucous membranes. Now I know for those of you who maybe have a medical degree that technically speaking, not all of these are mucous membranes but for our colloquial general, uh, general education here we're, we're gonna call these mucous membranes. And anytime there's fluid exchanged or touching any of these mucous membranes or an object that touches one mucous membrane and then another mucous membrane, sexually transmitted infections can be, as they're termed, transmitted, right? So um, the two that we talked about earlier, gonorrhea and chlamydia, um, are those two infections that generally stay at site of infection. So if you're thinking about, well, um, you know, my, you know my, uh, my mouth, right, does touch this body part, right? and that body part actually is sometimes used here, then theoretically, gonorrhea and chlamydia could be transmitted there. And if you were just to do the standard urine test for gonorrhea and chlamydia, you wouldn't test it, right? That would only work if, you're, you know, if your genitals are the primary form of sexual contact there. Transfeminine patients that still have a penis and use their penis for sexual activity um, sometimes note that there's a decrease in erections after a start initiation of hormone therapy, right? And we, you know, and this is not to say, oh, that's natural. And because you're transfeminine, you clearly don't want your penis. And that's not, you know, important. Again, you get to define your sexuality and what's, what's important to you and how sex looks like for you. So for our transfeminine feminine patients with penises who are facing a, this basically medically induced erectile dysfunction, talk to, your, uh, talk to your physician, talk to them about medications such as Cialis or Tadalafil or Sildenafil, right, Viagra. And these medications can actually help with erections and help our transfeminine patients have healthy, happy um, sexual lives, right? Uh, even when their, their, uh, their natural um, spontaneous erections are decreased by uh, a lack of testosterone. For our transmasculine patients who still have their native genitals, um, if we're if we're thinking about having sex using those genitalia, right? You may note that the uh, presence of testosterone naturally suppresses estradiol in the body, and that lack of estradiol may cause what we call vaginal canal atrophy. Right? Vaginal atrophy means that the walls are you know, a little bit thinner, a little bit more prone to bleeding, a little more sensitive, right? And this can make any sort of penetrative intercourse more painful. Um, if this is the case for you, what you may want to do is think about asking your physician for an estradiol cream, which can be applied topically. That estradiol cream that you use just for topical application won't be enough to feminize your body, 
So if you're worried about having feminization after masculinization with hormone therapy, for instance, that isn't as much of a concern. The other, the other thing that you can do that's very, very helpful is to use additional lubrication. Um, lubrication, especially water-based lubricants, um, can be very helpful. And I, I know that there is sometimes stigma saying like, oh, well, you know, part of this, this genitals function is that it, you know, it self lubricates, especially while aroused and not lubricating means I'm not aroused, but that's not necessarily the case, even in folks who aren't on any hormone medication. So it is really important to think about this in a holistic and practical standpoint when we're talking about our sexuality. We should also note that when two partners have vaginas, there is an extra STI, an extra sexually infect, uh, transmitted infection that we have to think about, and that is bacterial vaginosis. Um, this is something that is not typically transmitted between partners that uh, when both partners or all partners don't have vaginas, but when um, when at least two of the partners do have vaginas and are sharing any sort of touching contact, if fingers go in one orifice, then another, right? Or if a toy or a person were to enter one orifice, then another, then we can, uh, we can transmit this bacterial overgrowth from one, one to another. So we do recommend when possible, if this is some a rotating partner, a new partner or a hookup, right? That we should uh, use some sort of barrier contraception. Think about using a condom on insert toys or on fingers, or if, and then switching the condom between partners, or if there's, uh, you know, if you have, uh, if, if you want to do a form of contact where a condom wouldn't be appropriate, you can actually cut the condom down the side and remove the tip and you can form a kind of your own little dental dam to, to be a barrier for yourself. If for our folks who are engaging in receptive anal intercourse, which is bottoming, uh, especially amongst our um, MSM or men who have sex with men population, gay population, it's important to take care of your digestive health as well. Um, in this particular instance, if you know if your anus is part of your sexual play, it is effectively one of your sexual organs. So thinking of how we can protect it from things like hemorrhoids, right, and anal fissures is very very important. One thing is. Our guts were designed for us, you know, as hunter, we evolved as hunters and gatherers, right? So we ate a lot more fiber back in the day. And you and having more fiber in the diet can really help soften stool and protect us from having too much straining or harder stools, which may actually worsen hemorrhoids and anal fissures, making bottoming more difficult. So if we have, you know, so if you are to have um, a better diet with more fiber or to supplement with psyllium husk fiber, for instance, this can really help out in the long run. Another practice that is fairly common is the process practice of cleaning out or douching. Um, this can happen, uh, uh, anal douching in this particular case. Um, if you are to clean out, and we don't actually see it as medically necessary, but some people like to do it for their own hygiene practices. If you do do that, we recommend that you only use, you know, body temperature, slightly warm, uh, water without any soap or oils or extra things in it. Um, those things can all damage the rectum and the canal can dry out, can make the experience of bottoming more uncomfortable and can actually increase the risk of transmitted infections. Another thing that can happen is if you clean out with too much water, right? If water is allowed to go up the ascending colon, right? And across the bend, we have a, tra tra a transverse colon that is at the top of the ascending colon. There may be little pools of water that stay behind and can make a sexual activity really you know, uh, unpleasant. At least as you can give you a very unpleasant surprise later on. So what we recommend is use very small amounts of water when cleaning out. And if you were to clean out, just give yourself some time to reabsorb some of that water, right? So if you clean out, maybe wait for 20 minutes, half an hour before engaging in sexual activity. And that can give you a little bit additional protection too from having uh, something unexpected happen. For our patients who are engaging, it, who, who are at risk either with multiple partners or if you are in the MSM community, either gay or bisexual men, um, or engaging in transactional sex or just partners maybe that you aren't as familiar with, right? Then we, we would consider you at higher risk for exposure to HIV. 
in this particular case, obviously, you know, we still echo that barrier contraception is really effective, but there are some new advances. Um, since the early 2000s, we have been, you know, we have seen a rise in uptake for PrEP, which is short for pre-exposure prophylaxis to HIV specifically. And PrEP can be taken um, either once a daily or on an intermittent basis and can reduce rates of HIV transmission by up to 87%. And this is like, and, and this is, a relative risk reduction. So even though we know that any sexual contact with uh, an exposure to HIV doesn't necessarily result in 100% transmission of HIV, we can reduce the, the risk even from where it stands a further 87%, which is fan fantastic, right? The uh, once daily pill is, uh, is great, especially if you don't know when you may be taking, uh, having a sexual encounter, right? So if you have hookups that are a little more spontaneous, or you sometimes um, are, you know, you go out and you're not sure if you're going to meet someone and hook up, then having, uh, having prep daily might be really helpful. The, on the other hand, there is the intermittent dosing, which can be taken kind of as needed. If for folks who are better at planning out when or when they may not have sexual encounters or sexual partners, this can be really useful. Um, and you can take it as on an as needed basis. Um, talk to your physician about um, how that might be done. Uh, the medications that are in PrEP are processed through the kidneys, and they can cause a small um, uh, and a small bump in your uh, your uh, your creatine uh, creatinine levels. If you are using other medications or uh, that might be processed through the kidneys, or you might be um, have any sort of renal disease or a lot lack in kidney function, for whatever reason, um, you might want to talk to your doctor about ways you can offset that a little bit. There's also a small but statistically significant decrease in bone density, um, which based on our trials with um, highly active antiretroviral therapy, a heart therapy for HIV, we believe that this is also minimizable with calcium and vitamin, vitamin D supplementation. So make sure your diet's rich in calcium and vitamin D, or you can take supplements over the counter. Um, talking about your, uh, talking about you know which uh, you know which of these is important to think about when you're talking uh, when you're taking prep um, with your provider is is really important. Figuring out which one um, and there are multiple forms of prep now is right for you is all is based on all of these factors and your own personal and family history. We, of course, because we do we're specify, specifying that the previous slide is about pre-exposure prophylaxis to HIV, there's also post-exposure prophylaxis to HIV. Similar to emergency contraception, um, this is a, something that's taken after an exposure to HIV or an ex suspected exposure to HIV. And we do advise that our patients are a little bit, um, you know, proactive in this case. If you feel like you may have been exposed to HIV, even if you just don't know or don't trust or aren't really 100% sure, talk to your doctor about getting post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, this is uh, post-exposure prophylaxis has been around a lot longer than pre-exposure prophylaxis, and most physicians are very, very comfortable with it. Um, if, if initiated within 72 hours, it could decrease your risk by 81%. PEP is basically the same medications as PrEP, but we add on an extra agent, which we call the active agent. That isn't to say that the other agents in PrEP are inactive or in, uh, ineffective, right? But rather that they tend to passively block HIV uh, uptake, whereas our, our third agent, usually something called dolutegravir, is a little bit more aggressive. Um, because it is a little bit more aggressive and is combined with PrEP, it can have a few more side effects, such as headaches and GI upset um, when taking it. Mo you know, obviously these are um, these are distressing, and I'm not trying to minimize it, but often it's worth the extra protection when you feel fear you may have been exposed to HIV. If you're able to track down the the potential exposure source, right? If we're able to say, oh hey, we talked to them, you know, they you know they or also tested and they're HIV negative, and therefore you feel like the risk is is zero, and you talk to your your provider about it, um, it may be reasonable to stop PEP early if there's you know, little or no risk for HIV exposure. That way, you know, we minimize the, uh, the amount of discomfort from the medications. So as I noted before, not every single exposure to HIV is a 100% um, transmission rate. Um, and so, so what we wanna do is if you 
kind of drill down and we can see what the exposure rates and the infection rates are to HIV, we'll note that a few things are important. One is if you're in a population where you know transmitting and receive uh, transmitting and receiving HIV is easy per partner, for instance, the MSM community, including gay and bisexual men, then the rates of HIV are a little bit higher. Additionally, if for anyone who is receiving uh, in, in, a, in a sexual race relationship, uh, especially it, within a receptive anal intercourse, it's much easier to receive HIV than to get it if for uh, patients who are in topping or the insertive partner in anal intercourse. Um, all rates of, uh, of HIV transmission for oral sex are exceedingly low, although there are a few documented cases. So don't take that as a completely negligible, but low enough that we're not as worried about it, and we, I don't think that it's necessary to do um, PrEP or PEP specifically for people who are only engaging in oral intercourse. So another key point of, uh, of LGBTQ plus care is, of course, gender affirming care, right? So our philosophy is always that only you as the patient get to determine what your gender identity is and what a gender transition means to you. Sometimes people uh, are, are talk about like, what is the gender transition or how do trans women transition or how do trans men transition, right? And everyone's story is different. If anyone's telling you that there's a specific way, well, then they probably don't have as much experience with working with, uh, with our trans patients, right? Some patients need you know, want low dose or micro doses of hormones. Some need full doses and approach cisgender levels of, uh, or cis, uh, cisgender levels, either male or female for their chosen gender identity. Some only get surgery, some never get surgery, right? Everyone's different. And it really boils down to what is really validating and affirming for you as the patient. The provider's opinion and the, the point of the provider in this particular case is to spell out all the risks and benefits that you might be facing when going through the, the transition based on what you are hoping to do. At our office, we used an informed consent process, uh, which, is, which means to say, we'll take a form of paper um, that has all of the risks and benefits kind of spelled out we'll ma to make sure that we're able to go through it with you. And we, we sign it together to say that you do understand these risks and benefits, and you would like to start hormone therapy based on what the criteria that we've laid out. I like to break out, uh, break down a gender transition into several pillars, right? Rather than saying steps, because it's not a logical next step, next step uh, process. It is actually four different, at least four different components that all patients either touch on or use based on what their needs are. And those pillars are medical, surgical, social, and legal. So a medical transition is Basically, if we, if we think about it from a medical standpoint, it's basically the process of putting a patient through a puberty, right? Either, um, e and most of our patients as adults usually have had gone through puberty at least once. Some of our younger patients maybe haven't gone through puberty, the, what we would call the wrong puberty the first time. And by using appropriate medical intervention, including puberty blockade, we can allow those patients to go through the correct puberty. For adult patients, unfortunately, we can't reverse the effects necessarily of, uh, of the previous puberty, but we can allow the patient to go through a second puberty and use all of our medical and surgical interventions to try to minimize the effects from the puberty they went through that didn't align with their gender identity. Our standard feminizing reg uh, regimen typically involves some form of estradiol that bypasses first pass metabolism. First mass pass metabolism means what happens in the liver when you swallow a medication. So, so uh, you'll know, so our three forms are either sublingual estradiol, which is taken under the tongue and absorbed by the big blood vessels under the tongue, um, patches, which absorb through the skin, or injections, which are absorbed through the uh, through either the fat tissue or the muscle tissue, um, subcutaneous or intramuscular. Now, all of those you'll notice aren't swallowed pills, and the reason is because once estradiol is swallowed, it gets converted by the liver, and one of the major forms it's converted to is estrone, which doesn't have a lot of feminization um, really associated with it and may actually be associated with higher rates of coagulopathy or clotting, which no one ever says, oh yes, my gender identity requires me to clot a lot. I would really like a lot of blood clots, right? So in order to make that the safest, one of these three forms of administration is typically used. 
A lot of our uh, trans feminine patients also end up using some form of anti-androgen. Estradiol has some negative feedback inhibition. That means to say, when there is estradiol in the system, it often tells the brain, hey, we're a hormone, we're here, you don't have to produce so much. And the brain usually you know, ramps down production of testosterone or whatever the native hormone is by a little bit, but it's not necessarily as strong as testosterone going the other way, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, of the, of the anti-androgens, typically patients will use either spironolactone, um, ciproterone in the, U, uh, in the EU and UK, although that's not really available in the US, it's not unfortunately FDA approved for anything, so it's just not really manufactured and sold, um, uh, bicalutamide, which is used for prostate cancer, and also um, GnRH agonists such as Lupron, which are injections that can help um, stop pro uh, hormone production right at that brain level, stopping the signal from the brain to the gonads to pr prevent them from creating, creating hormone in the first place. Masculinizing regimens are pretty straightforward because it's almost always just testosterone. Um, testosterone most commonly is in a subcutaneous injection. Um, it, it is technically rated for IM injections, but there was a study that came out in 2014 demonstrating that testosterone subcutaneous injections work just as well for serum levels of testosterone and seem to be significantly less painful for our patients. So these are uh, so we currently use subcutaneous, uh, subcutaneous injections for almost all our patients. It's also available in a gel and a patch, as well as a pellet form, which can be placed every three months. Uh, but all of those tend to be less well covered by insurance, um, not to mention sometimes not, um, not quite as convenient for some of our patients. So the effects of feminizing hormones we've laid out in a chart here. Um, it varies, right? Everyone has their own personal genetics, their own personal body habitus, and their age of when they started. So everything is a little bit different, but this is kind of our general uh, guideline map. And you'll notice that it kind of mimics very similar to slowing down some of those effects from male puberty and starting our own female puberty. Um, we'll have decreases in libido, erections, testicular volume, and maybe even sperm production. Um, the, the breast growth development also can start about three to six months. A lot of our patients are very eager for some, for some of these changes, but we should note that they take place over three to five years, just like natal puberty, right? Um, we don't expect our 11 and 12 year olds to have finished puberty by the end of their first year of puberty. And neither do we expect that for our trans feminine or trans masculine patients. Our masculinizing hormones, again, very similar to starting puberty. You'll notice that there's acne, voice deepening, and, um, and facial flushing kind of early on. None of the effects that people you typically go to, uh, you know, go to hormone therapy for, but still, it, it, you know, you get what you get with puberty, unfortunately, in most cases. Um, luckily, going through puberty a second time, most people have a little bit more wisdom and a little more foresight into what the effects that might occur and are able to stave off some of those, uh, some of the worst of the effects that they are kind of unwanted. Um, and then having that muscle, uh, muscle mass, uh, fat redistribution, having some of those genital changes and emotional changes happening a little bit after those initial changes, um, and again, peaking out at three to five years. Surgical transition typically uh, for our trans feminine patients includes any of these. And again, not everyone gets all of these. In fact, most people don't get all of the surgeries listed on this on, on this list. And there are, are a few surgeries that are not listed on this list that people may want and find are very affirming for them. These are just the most common. So I'm just gonna list through these. Uh, facial affirmation surgery, that is changes and structural changes to the face that allow patients to feel more feminine and look and appear more feminine. Laryngoplasty, which changes only the pitch of the vo of voice by changing the vocal cords. Now, laryngoplasty does not make someone speak more feminine. Uh, it, it, the human range, of course, is, is actually fairly large. It only increases the pitch. All of the other factors, the voice, resonance, intonation, speech patterns, is all, uh, all learned behavior. And so vocal coaches can be extremely helpful with that. 
mammoplasty or breast augmentation slash top surgery is another uh, surgery that's very common. Um, breast tissue is often thought of as a very visible marker of femininity, and it can be associated with, with femininity for a lot of folks. So um, sometimes if breast development is not substantial enough, either we didn't have the genetics for it, we started to, hormone therapy too late, or you know, for other reasons, um, some of our patients will get a little bit of augmentation to really enhance the, uh, the development. Hair removal is very common. Um, laser or electrolysis hair removal are typically used. Laser hair removal is thought of as really effective, especially for folks with dark hair and lighter skin and for large areas of the body. Electrolysis is more painful than laser and more expensive and time consuming, but can be better for places like the face um, and is one of, one of our kind of tried and true methods of hair removal. Uh, bottom surgeries or surgeries that involve the genitals um, involve orchiectomy and vaginoplasty. There's a few vaginoplasties that are available. The one that's most common is the penile inversion vag vaginoplasty. And this is done by quite a few surgeons here in the Bay Area. This typically takes the tissue of the penis, the genitals, and in, uh, inverts them, turning them into a functional uh, vagina, a fun functional vaginal canal. Uh, our patients who have this it, say, you know, feel that the cosmetic outcome is great and also the functional outcome is, is excellent. Many of them reporting being able to reach orgasm during sexual intercourse. Um, the peritoneal pull-through is a newer technique that's a pioneer, uh, pioneered by a few surgeons, including one here in the Bay Area. That peritoneal pull-through uses a small amount of tissue from the, uh, from the abdominal cavity to form a self-lubricating vaginal canal. Now, this is, a, you know, there's a lot of potential benefits to the peritoneal pull through, but we have to also remember that it's relatively new. And so it's while it's on the cutting edge, we don't know what long-term outcomes might be for the peritoneal pull through. Some of our patients getting a bottom surgery or a vaginoplasty may actually say, I'm not really interested in being penetrated at all, or, or you know, my sexual intercourse won't involve um, genital, uh, uh, genitalia specifically. I just would like to have more female appearing genitals, in which case a zero depth vaginoplasty may be very helpful. In this particular case, the, the outer labia the, uh, and uh, glands are, sorry, and the uh, clitoris is created, but no, no real vaginal canal or a very short vaginal canal is created, um, thereby actually decreasing the amount of time for healing, which is really nice, keeping a wonderful external appearance um, and allowing good sensation from, uh, from sexual contact, but no penetration. For masculinizing surgery, there's of course facial affirmation surgery, similar to uh, feminizing facial affirmation surgery, but of course masculinizing instead of feminizing. There's chest reconstruction, often termed male chest reconstruction or top surgery. And this is typically um, removal or reduction of the breast tissue. Keep in mind that because we are, uh, we are um, not doing a surgical mammoplasty, which is what a uh, 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 so mammectomy, um, we were, you know, we were thinking um, we some breast tissue will be left behind, right? So since some breast tissue gets left behind, all risk of breast cancer is not removed. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. Um, metoidioplasty or phalloplasty are what we would consider bottom surgery in this particular case. Again, similar to the vo uh, vocabulary for our feminizing surgeries. These surgeries involve the genitals. Uh, phalloplasty is creation of a neopenis or neophallus, and this is created usually, usually using a flap of skin from the forearm, leg, or abdomen, and um, and creating a uh, creating that by uh, by attaching it to the pelvis. A metoidioplasty typically does not involve any sort of grafting material. It only involves enhancing the natal, um, the natal genitals such they are, they are more masculine in appearance, including vaginectomy, removal of the vag vaginal canal, and um, sometimes creation of a scrotum from the labia tissue. Social transition is the third pillar that we talk about when we're talking about the goals of transition with our patients. Um, and this usually involves coming out or starting to change the way you're dressing, behaving, acting, speaking with, uh, uh, with other people around you. Um, having a social worker who's well-versed in LGBTQ health 
can really help with coming out or building family support. In some clinics, what happens is when a patient is first seen for gender affirming care, a social worker will also go with their family members that came with them to really start the, the ball in educa uh, educating these, uh, the, uh, the family members. We note that our patients that do the best usually have the best family support. It's the number one protective factor for our trans and queer youth. Um, it's really important to have some form of social support. And we recognize that not if, for a lot of our patients, having biological family support is not always possible. One of the, you know, one of the benefits of being in the LGBTQ community is that you have an automatic community. And there are so many places uh, where LGBTQ folks have gone and formed chosen families. And we, so we don't see necessarily that biological family has to fill this role um, and chosen families are sometimes even closer. And finally, in the transition, the pillars of transition that we spoke about, and again, this is just a really brief overview. This is certainly by no means all the aspects of gender transition and gender affirming care, um, but just a quick overview for folks who are thinking about what, how they might bring up some of these topics with their physician. A legal transition um, in the state of California does not typically need a lot of medical or surgical documentation. In fact, medical or surgical transition are not required to update your name and gender on identity uh, documents in California or from the federal government. Um, in California, no medical letters required for even changing your name and gender on your driver's license. You can actually, uh, since 2014, if you go and tell them you're updating your gender marker, you can update your license at the same time. For social, uh, for social security card updating, I know that the social security card itself doesn't have a gender marker on it, but actually the database it's associated with does have a gender marker. So it is important to update that documentation and you can get that updated by getting a court order from your local court. Um, uh, and then going, to, uh, going on to your passport, passports can be updated and they, that will require a letter from your medical provider. Um, just stating something as simple as the fact that you see them, they are your doctor, they reviewed your medical records and they agree that this is your gender and you've undergone appropriate medical transition for your gender, which again, it can only be defined by you. Right, some some of our uh, of our folks, our gender diverse folks, don't necessarily go through any medical or surgical transition at all. But that's still enough to to dictate their own gender. You and only you get to know what your gender identity is and how you share that with the world. In within our gender um, uh, gender affirming care, we also should think about family planning and family building. So gender of transition impacts fertility. If we were to start you on any form of hormone therapy, it'll suppress your natal gonads and the risk for having lower rates of fertility in the future are dramatically increased. We encourage you to talk to your providers about fertility preservation, even if you only are thinking about maybe having a biological family in the future, right? Because we, this is something that people will, you know, can really regret later on when they want to have a biological family but aren't able to. Um, we, we see that, you know, very, very low rates of regret for folks who go through hormone transition, but su substantially higher rates of regret for folks who wish they had uh, done some, some, some form of fertility preservation prior to initiating hormone therapy to protect that ability to have children. Um, at the same moment, we should also note that uh, for hormone therapy is also not very good contraception, right? It's not necessarily going to protect you from pregnancy or from making someone pregnant. So anytime a, a sperm could even theoretically meet an egg, care should be really, really taken to prevent unwanted pregnancy. Um, in the case of our trans, um, our trans masculine individuals, um, we can think about something like uh, something that doesn't feminize. So some uh, oral contraception, uh, uh, typically has some form of estradiol in it, although not all of them do. So when you're talking to your provider about what forms of, uh, of contraception can work for you, think about forms that either have no hormone, such as the Paragard or the copper IUD intrauterine device, or something that has non-estradiol uh, um, hormones, such as um, some sort of progestin. Next, we wanna talk a little bit about organ-based cancer screening, especially for our folks who are, um, uh, who are in the gender diverse population and uh, in our transgender patients. 
your organs may not line up with the organs that are expect expected by your physician, whether or not you've had surgery. So it may be important to think, uh, think about which organs may get cancer for you. And while technically speaking, almost every single one of our organs could develop cancer, there are a few that we, we note that screening is extremely important. And that's breast cancer, cervical cancer, colon cancer, anal cancer, and prostate cancer. Typically speaking, if you don't know how to screen one of these for cancer, think about what a cisgender heterosexual patient would do with the same at the same age and think about how that they would be screened. Although there's a few changes and we'll talk about that right now. So first for breast cancer screening, the American College of Radiology has uh, released some new recommendations uh, recommending that we screen our patients for breast cancer starting at age 40 if they've developed breast during puberty and they haven't had a complete removal of breast tissue. So including those, uh, that, that includes our transmasculine patients who got some form of uh, male chest reconstruction or top surgery, some breast tissue is still left behind because you know cis, even cis men don't have naturally scalloped chest with absolutely no breast tissue. So we still wanna do some form of screening for breast cancer in this population. Alternatively, if you are transfeminine or have developed breast tissue, if you've been on hormone therapy that could be part of that breast tissue development for at least five years, screen as if you were a cisgender woman using the same exact screening guidelines at starting at five years after initiating hormone therapy. Um, earlier screening is often warranted if you have other risks such as family history of breast cancer or genetic predisposition to breast cancer, such as the BRCA1 or 2 genes, or have a history of radiation exposure to the chest region. Cervical cancer screening. Um, for any patient with a cervix, whether or not it's used and engaged in sexual activity, we recommend screening for, uh, screening for cancer every three years, starting at age 21. And that's with a pap smear, as we, what we call cytology. Um, th those looks at, look at cells and can tell you if there's any early signs of cancer in those cells. For patients that are uh, 30 through 65, we recommend screening every five years with cytology and with HPV screening, HPV standing for human papillomavirus, the causative agent for both cervical cancer and anal cancer. Um, and one of the reasons I'm bringing up cervical cancer screening here is our WSWs, so our women who have having sex with women, typically speaking, are, uh, and that includes our lesbian and bisexual women um, uh, we and our trans masculine individuals, so our transgender men, both of those populations often see a, a decrease in going to the physician even more than the rest of the LGBTQ population. So missed cervical cancer screening is becomes a really big problem for our, our, uh, these, uh, this patient population. And so we should note that uh, we really encourage our patients who are who are having uh, who have a cervix still to make sure we get it screened. Inner, anal cancer screening. So this is not a, a screening that's typically done with our cisgender heterosexual uh, population, but it should be noted that patients who uh, are at higher risk for anal cancer screening, that's maybe anyone who is engaging in receptive anal intercourse or anyone who has cervical, a positive cervical cancer screening um, may want to think about doing some form of, of pap screening. We recommend starting at age uh, 25 with just um, for our, our just our patients who are living with HIV. Um, even patients who have HIV but are well controlled have an increased risk of anal carcinoma. So having an annual anal pap sc uh, screening is really important. And the anal pap is not the same as a cervical pap. It's not done with a speculum and a brush, and it's it, it's actually just done with a tiny Q-tip. So it's actually pretty reasonable if you ask your doctor about it. Um, for patients who are uh, who are 40 or older, even if they are not uh, not uh, living with HIV, we recommend anal pap screening every two or three years to, uh, in this population, especially that's what the MSM population, including gay and bisexual men. Um, for patients who are not in those populations or perhaps are not in those populations yet, um, but are still at risk, you can consider an anal, uh, annual anal digital rectal exam. So that's using just a finger and sweeping around looking for any masses um, in patients who are, uh, who are in this population. Immunizations, um, also to think about, 
um, that, that may help prevent against these. HPV is a three dose vaccination series that can reduce the uh, rates of cervical, uh, cervical cancer and anal cancer by 80% if you get all three uh, boosters. The hepatitis A and B vaccinations are safe and effective for reducing risk in our sexually active patients, and we recommend them. Many of our younger patients are getting both of these, but some of our patients who are over the age of 35 may not have gotten these routinely, so you may want to talk to your physician about them. Insurance may not want to want to cover some of these, so it may become a risk-benefit ratio for you and your physician when you're talking. Prostate cancer screening. So for our patients ages 55 through 69 who still have a prostate, right, should discuss the benefits of screening with their physician. PSA, the prostate specific antigen test, is notoriously hypersensitive and can uh, often give false positives. So talk to your uh, talk to your physician about what things may cause it to give a false positive and what you would do in the case of a positive test versus a negative test to make a plan, thinking that making sure that if there is a false positive, we have a plan to not go immediately to biopsy unless we're highly suspicious for some form of prostate cancer. Next, we wanna talk a little bit about mental health. Um, our LGBTQ pa uh, patient population, as we noted previously, has much higher rates of stigma and, uh, and discrimination that faces it. And having to deal with the, that on a daily basis means that higher, we also suffer from higher rates of uh, suicidality, depression, and other mental health disorders. Nearly 50% of gender minority youth will attempt suicide uh, by their 21st birthday. In our uh, uh, people of color, POC populations that identify as gen uh, transgender or gender diverse, um, that number increases to nearly 90%. Um, these, uh, these patients also can note that the period of gender transition can be extremely tumultuous. So seeking a mental health provider who is well-versed in gender-affirming care, even before we feel like we need one, is super important. Um, there are a few resources here, which I'll leave, but I'll kind of breeze through this slide in order to make sure um, that we are able to finish on time. Um, finally, one of the most important things uh, to factors in L good LGBTQ care is having access, right? And unfortunately, as a patient, it's difficult to really advocate for excellent access because it feels like you're, you know, telling, talking to people who may not know what they're doing or may not care. And it's and what can one person do? But whenever you can, um, you know, recognize that we're in this together. If you're an LGBTQ patient, or perhaps an ally, um, and you you know, hear about your, your provider potentially, uh, potentially being able to offer something that would help other members of the LGBTQ community advocate strongly for this, because this can really make a difference in someone's life. And I uh, left a, a, just a few minutes for questions here. I see one question in the Q&A here. Do you have a sense, any sense of what WPATH 8.0 will be addressing? And so th what this question is, uh, was asking about is what the new recommendations in the new um, standard, uh, standard guidelines that come out from the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. Um, you know, I'm unfortunately not on the committees for the WPATH 8. I do, uh, I do feel like there will be a shift in how a, a lot of previous um, editions, including seven, kind of focused on having a letter of readiness and evaluation by mental health providers before being able to start with gender transition. And I'm getting a sense from the providers I'm talking to that we may be shifting a little bit more towards informed consent and patient autonomy. Aside from that, I can't really tell you too much more. We have another question. Um, how do our physicians and medical staff stay aware and educated on LGBTQ needs? Um, at, uh, at Stanford, we have, uh, uh, we have regular uh, faculty development, which helps our, patient, uh, helps our faculty stay on top of their, uh, the new advances in LGBTQ health. And we also have a monthly care coordination um, meeting where all of our providers, that's in, that's, there's over 23 of us scattered across uh, uh, Stanford who all provide different aspects of LGBTQ um, health. Um, we all kind of meet uh, about once a month to discuss patient cases and on upcoming uh, changes in LGBTQ health, and that allows us to stay on top of it. We also disseminate this information to other faculty members and staff members to help uh, Stanford as a whole continue to grow in its approach to LGBTQ health 
but it's an ever-changing, ever-evolving process. And many of you who maybe uh, attend either, uh, healthcare either with us or with another provider may note that many things uh, change slowly. And so little things are, do require advocacy whenever possible. We have another question in the, uh, in the chat. Do you have a resource to how we find providers who are LGBTQ affirming outside of Stanford? Um, there are a few resources. The one that comes to mind, other than w, uh, WPATH for folks who are uh, who are seeking gender affirming care, is uh, has a registry of physicians who and providers who are uh, gender affirming and are comfortable doing gender affirming care. Although it doesn't to be a member, it doesn't require you to pass a test. So you know you may want to have a discussion with that provider on exactly what their experience level is before you know making any decisions. The other, uh, the other place that comes to mind is GLAMA, G-L-M-A, um, also has a directory where LGBTQ plus affirming physicians often will sign up in a directory uh, for, for patients to find. We have another question in the chat. How do we know which PCPs specialize in LGBTQ plus throughout the enterprise, both Stanford and UMP? Um, so at Stanford, um, there when you go to the Stanford profiles, you can actually search by provider to see who's LGBTQ. There's also um, the Stanford LGBTQ uh, program has its own website, which lists the providers that work within our LGBTQ program. Um, what advice do you have for people beginning a graduate journey who want to focus on LGBTQ health? If you wanna spend some time focusing on LGBTQ health, awesome and welcome. We, you know, we're super excited to have you because this is such a, a big field with so many questions that are currently un unanswered. Um, I would say seek out mentors who are already doing work in LGBTQ health and see if you can, if you're thinking about research, work with them in research and ask those questions that are really important to our, uh, uh, to our community. There is, of course, um, there are some research programs here at Stanford, which I won't spend a lot of time advertising, but including, of course, the PRIDE study, which does a lot of work that's community driven, looking for answers to questions that uh, the community are asking rather than academics are asking. And if you're thinking about a, a, a journey into medicine, looking for a medical school or a residency program, which either has an LGBTQ clinic or has uh, LGBTQ specialized faculty that can help guide you and mentor you when you're learning. I think we are unfortunately at end of time, but thank you so much for, um, for coming to this talk. I really appreciate everyone's attention. I know it's a, a lot of me rambling on for almost an hour. <laughs> so I, I appreciate you sticking with me. If you have any other questions, you feel uncomfortable asking them here, you'd rather not put them in chat. My email was on that final slide. It's just my last name at stanford.edu. Would love to chat with any of you offline. Um, maybe we can even set up some time to talk. Thank you, Dr. Lanake, for sharing this great information on such a significant topic. To the audience, thank you for joining us and for your interesting questions. If you would like additional information or resources, you can also contact our librarians at healthlibrary at stanfordhealthcare.org. We hope to see you again at our next, next lecture. Thanks so much, everybody. Good night. Good night.